I want to I want to show you this. So I uh, I'm online yesterday and I'm preparing for this year. I go and uh, look up two articles. One I want to see what uh, ACLU says about the problem of Black Americans, and then I go look up PragerU. Okay, I'm sure you're familiar with both organizations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's go through the ACLU one. If you can kind of pull pull that one up first, Rob, that'd be great. Okay. So go all the way to the top of the article so we can kind of read what it says. So here's ACLU, Five Truths About Black History. If you want to understand the state of race in America, we need to know our past, particularly the painful parts. Okay, so to go down now and zoom in uh, uh, on what it says. Go up, go up, go, keep going, keep going, keep going. America was founded on white supremacy. I mean, this is what AC, AO, AA, ACLU says straight up. The first slave arrived here in 1619. Again, going back to the 1619 project. Between 1619 and 1865, Virginia passed more than 130 slave statutes to regulate the ownership of black people. In a 1662 law made all children of enslaved mothers slaves regardless of the father's race or status or that rape by white slave masters couldn't create a free child. A 1667 uh, law codified codified that slaves were, who converted to Christianity were still slaves. A 1669 law allowed slaves to be killed for resisting authority, right? Okay, go lower. Let's go to the next one. So this article is ACLU. Next one, terrorism. Even if we refuse to acknowledge it, okay, and it explains terrorism. Uh, on what's going on. Uh, the largest terrorist attack in Oklahoma was not the federal building in Oklahoma City in 1995. It was down the road in Tulsa 1921. The Greenhood neighborhood of Tulsa, Oklahoma was unique. In the early 20th century, it was referred to the Black Wall Street and was home to black and Native Americans who had become wealthy from old dis- discoveries. And then it goes to saying white residents were distributed, disturbed by the growing black wealth and sought to impose official segregation measures. In 2014, Tulsa passed a law that forbade anyone from living a blo- on a block where more than three-quarters of the pre-existing residents were uh, from another race. Okay, so let's go a little bit. If somebody wants to read more, we'll put the link below. Next. So keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, then we have a war for, was fought for slavery. By 1860, America had 4 million slaves worth a total of $3 billion of today's currencies. Okay, let's go to the next one. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. Francis Scott Key was an avowed white supremacist. Keep going to the next one. Uh, which is the last one. Reparations for slavery have already been paid, okay? Uh, On April 16, 1862, more than eight months before he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, Abraham Lincoln signed a bill ending slavery in the District of Columbia. It provided for immediate uh, emancipation of slaves and compensation to slave owners loyal to the union of up to $300 for each freed slave. Over the next nine months, the the Board of Commissioners appointed to administer the act approved petitions completely or in part for former owners of Freedom 2989 former slaves. Lincoln administration paid about a million dollars to slave owners in D.C. for the loss of property. If you don't know some of these facts before reading them here, what else don't you know about the hidden truths of black American history? Okay, so that's ACLU. Now let's go to Prager. Here's what Prager U says. The top five issues facing black Americans. Number five, victim mentality. Okay, Um, not holding someone back from more than seeing himself as a victim. Why? Because a victim is not responsible for a situation. Everything is someone else's fault. And a victim sees little chance of improving his life. How he, how can he get ahead if there's someone holding him back? All this makes him victim. All this makes the victim unhappy, frustrated, and angry. And then in the bottom, it says, so victim, so much on the victim status, primary center. I, can, uh, I call it victimology. Unfortunately, many black churches uh, preach the victimology. Many black parents pass it on to their children. Inner city schools teach it to their students. And the black media reinforces it. Meanwhile, the NAACP and other black grievance groups fundraise it. Number four, lack of diversity. Blacks repeatedly demand an honest dialogue on debate about race. But how can there be an honest dialogue about race between blacks and whites when there is virtually no honest dialogue between blacks and blacks? It's hypocritical. And if a black does, does think whites are ultimately responsible for black people's problems, they're labeled a sellout, an Uncle Tom, a race trader. I'm sure you've experienced some of that yourself over the years. Mm-hmm. As long as this type of group thing exists, race reverence of the Al Sharpton's Jesse Jackson types will continue to be celebrated while independent black thinkers such as Professor Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, and yourself will be shunned. Okay, let's go to number three, urban terrorism. As just about everyone knows, but few talk about publicly in major black cities, violent black-on-black crimes is, a, is rampant. A Department of Justice study from 1980 to 2008 revealed that blacks accounted for almost half of the nation's homicide victims, 47.4%, and more than half of offenders, 524 all while only 
uh, uh, of Americans' population. Okay, so that's another study. We can go to go to the next one. Number two, proliferation of baby mamas, the disintegration of the nuclear family, which you talked about briefly earlier. According to uh, Mohan uh, report, he was a senator, I believe, right, Tom? Uh, how do you say his last name? Daniel Patrick Monahan. Yeah, Monahan. In 1965, nearly 25% of black children were born to unwed mothers. The report author, Daniel Patrick, said that this was a disaster in the making. He, of course, vilified by so-called black leaders and their progressive allies, but he was right. Today, out of wedlock, birth rates is nearly 75%. 1965, I think you talked about this earlier, 25% to today, 75%. Last but not least is the unquestioning allegiance to so-called progressive policies, okay? Unwavering loyalty to progressive liberal policies is the primary reason why these dire conditions exist. It both makes them possible and perpetuates them. It's no coincidence that progressism is the common thread that binds predominantly black cities where single-parent homes, failing schools, rampant poverty, and uh, crime uh, predominate. I can keep reading this and talking about what's going on in the Truffle Delta. The point I want to make is two very different views of the problem we're facing in America. One is, you know, white supremacist, here's what happened, even this, even that. The other one is responsibility, do something about it, but here's the problem. How do we get these two groups to either come together, and if we can't, how do you get the people that are in the middle open-minded to say, trust me, this mindset on this side it's going to give you a better life than this mindset on this side wanting to be a victim? Again, I think that the, the response to Oliver Anthony's song uh, gives you a, a hint at that. There is a thirst, a deep thirst for virtue. Uh, the very fact that a homeless man in Boston uh, a couple of years back uh, found a knapsack with $43,000 in it and turned it in. And with, there was a GoFundMe, and within three days, they raised $93,000 for him. That meant deep in, in, and that happened four times. Uh, a black man in o- Oakland who was homeless, 53 years old, a woman emptied her change purse and her $15,000 diamond hmm. wedding bracelet was there. When she went back five hours later, he said, you're looking for this. They had a fundraiser for him, $100,000. That says to me that deep in, the, in, in is a desire to support virtue like that. And, and so what we do with, is that the way you undermine the moral authority of the ACLU and all these other groups is to equip the people suffering the problem to speak for themselves. And they speak for themselves the way um, the, uh, the, the, the Black Mothers United have come together, for example. You, you support groups so that now we've got 20 chapters, about 2,000 of these moms who are having uh, uh, positive interactions. We were honoring the police and organizing uh, events with students are being mobilized by the thousands who speak out against violence. In other words, you've got to invest in the institutions within those communities where people are speaking up for themselves uh, and make them the new heroes. But again, it's going to take uh, investment. But, but conservatives don't, don't invest the way, uh, the way they do. They'll invest in think tanks because their children can go there and be interns. <laughs> and and we, you know, we seem to think all you got to do is publish the right policies, uh, and then people will change. It, it's not a rhetorical battle that we're in. This is a, this is a battle for meaning. This is a battle of substance. We must demonstrate to the American public that the values of this nation have the consequence of improving the quality of life. And, and, no, no, and if people can find content and meaning in their life in a drug-infested, crime-ridden neighborhood, and we highlight that and celebrate it and make them the new heroes, then they are the ones that we can stand shoulder to shoulder with and say, we must uh, we must push back, but again, it takes investment. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting you say this. I, I look at uh, um, I run multiple companies, and when when you run multiple companies, then you have multiple C suites, then you have multiple department managers, general managers, people that are running leaders, and one group will have five employees reporting to them with ten on the team. One will have twenty, one will have thirty, one will have eight, 
And I'll go to one department, I'm like, wow, everybody here is so enthusiastic. They come to work so excited. Right. They want to say, hey, let's show to the company that we are the best department, right? We're excited to get stuff done. And then you go to one department, and I'll talk to one employee, another employee, another employee. They're all like, well, how's your day? Well, you know, we're trying to, I've had better days, and, you know, we're going to see what's going to happen. And I'm like, why does everybody talk like they're miserable, you know, <laughs> and so, like, unhappy and victims? And then you go and talk to the leader at the top. Well, you know, it's, you, no one ever gives us credit, and no one ever does this. I'm like, got it. So then you go and you look at two coaches. And as a father, I got four kids. Uh, my my uh, youngest son, he's had a lot of different baseball coaches, okay? And he's currently with a coach that he loves. He really likes working for this guy. But this guy busts his butt. Like, I remember one time uh, he said something. The coach comes in. He says, hey, he comes up and say, uh, Pat, I just want to tell you, he's going to be running the entire practice today. I'm like, do your thing. I said, but tell me why. Because he did this, this, this. I said, no, totally get it. Go for it. I got your back. So what does the coach do? He puts him to work. Running, 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 running. I mean, it's hot outside. Running, 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 running. <sighs> but you know what? We're going to go back to that coach because he produces winners. He produces toughness. He produces a teamwork mentality. He produces a level of humility. He produces the love of the game. It's exciting to want to play for this guy. We had another coach where it's like, you don't know what you're doing. Da, 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 ba, 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 ba. Everything was just constantly like negative, this, this, that. And he just, kids didn't want to play for him. So for me, both sides can say whatever they want to say. But at the end of the day, there's only one way we judge which philosophy is a better philosophy. And it's based on the fruits it bears, period. Based on what you produce. If you produce good citizens that do great things, you're doing some right. Tom's got two girls. One of them got a 1560 on her SAT out of 1600, okay? She gets to go to whatever school she wants to go to. She's got a 4.6 GPA at one of the best schools in the state of Florida with, I think, the best math program in, this, in the entire state of Florida. And she's very, very smart. So is their youngest daughter. Guess what? The parents are doing something right. The philosophies they're teaching is something right. So for me, scream off the top of your lungs. Say whatever you want to say. If one uh, philosophy is producing leaders. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.